This is lecture 10b for History 111. So I was talking about the Byzantine Empire last time and how Justinian had sort of given it a good foundation after the break with the Western Roman Empire. And I want to follow up on some aspects of Byzantine culture now. First of all, I want to point out that Justinian had worked out the Justinian Code, which is a legal system for all the just for the Byzantine Empire, but built into the code were some serious powers for the emperor. Essentially, the emperor could write laws, the emperor could change the laws, and the emperor was considered to be above the law. The laws didn't apply to the emperor. Now, emperors tended to follow the Justinian Code and not mess with it because, for the most part, it was a, it was a brilliant piece of legal writing. Um, but that didn't mean that emperors couldn't constantly be coming up with new laws for new situations. <clears throat> and the emperors were actually very, um, they were very powerful um, at the top of this enormous bureau bureaucracy. And, and, you know, bureaucracy is an is a, is a administration filled up with people who have specific offices for record keeping and, and, and enforcing laws and running court systems, etc. And so the Byzantine Empire had a really powerful bureaucracy. And this allowed the emperor to have much more power because he had this efficient mechanism for making his desires become reality through this Byzantine um, bureaucracy. And this, this bureaucracy, by the time, I mean, by the time of the break between the Eastern and Western Roman Empires, um, the bureaucracy was, you know, had, had been around for 700 years or so, and now it would go on in this empire for another thousand years, and it would really be efficient in a lot of ways. Now, it would, over time, also get, gain some inefficiencies as people got sort of stuck in ruts and decided they just want to do it this way and not try new things. But the bureaucracy is a really powerful thing. And, and when we see the really big empires, you can't overstate how important a bureaucracy is. I mean, China has these Confucian scholars, and I'll talk more about them and how they're trained and, uh, and how they become a really efficient form of bureaucracy. And, um, and Persia and India had, had really good bureaucrats. And, and this is crucial for building a large empire because you have to be able to manage lots of soldiers and lots of tax dollars and lots of trade and and all sorts of different properties and, and you have to have good communications with the whole of your realm. This is all requires a whole lot of paperwork and requires a whole lot of systems of record keeping. Bureaucracy is really the backbone of an empire. Now I want to turn to one other aspect of the Byzantine Empire which is that the Byzantine Empire when it was part of the larger Roman Empire, okay, you've got the Eastern and Western Roman Empires, Constantine had converted the empire to Christianity, essentially. He had not himself converted to Christianity before his, his deathbed, you know, he did it on his deathbed. Um, but he legalized Christianity, and then he began to do things to funnel government money to Christianity uh, and to Christian churches. And, and soon after Constantine, it was really obvious that the Christianity was the official religion of the Roman Empire. But this has important implications because the religion is now connected to the government. It's now an official religion. It has to be a stabilizing religion if it's going to be the religion of a lar official religion of a large empire. And there are a couple things that I mentioned before with the development of Christianity that are real issues that Constantine doesn't like and he wants to address. And I, I talked before about how you know the, the, the Bible wasn't codified yet. Then there were lots of Christian writings floating around, but nobody knew which ones were official and which ones weren't. And so one of the things that Constantine's early church does is comes up with a list of books for an official Bible. And another thing they do is they, at the, at the Council of Nicaea in 325, they have a, they decide on some theological issues. You know, what is the status of Jesus? Is he human? Is he a God? Etc. They, they come up with the official Holy Trinity which is that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are all three aspects of one single uh, deity. Which means that Jesus also himself was entirely God, but also was entirely human. Um, but there were some other things that Constantine was not happy about also. And one of them was that there was a profound division within Christianity over what exactly they thought about that trinity and what they thought about Jesus. There was a group called the Arians who didn't agree with that. They, 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 they thought that Jesus was entirely human. They thought that he was not God, and he was not part of God, and they rejected the Holy Trinity. Um, they didn't really recognize the Holy Spirit at all. And so Arians had a very profoundly different idea of what Christianity was all about. And, and Constantine recognized that if this was going to be an official religion, 
you had to deal with this. You had to have everybody on the same page. You couldn't have this profound split because it would constantly create divisions within the community. And, and the last thing the empire wants is people getting into religious spats with each other. So the Council of Nicaea's job was really as a sort of an enforcer. They were supposed to decide which was the right position, and then that was the one the government was going to take. And that's exactly what happened. The government simply said, we are going to embrace the Holy Trinity, uh, the Trinitarian doctrine, um, and Arians are now wrong. They're heretics. right? And from that point onward, the church would go after Arians. Now, ironically, at a few later emperors actually tr were converted to Arianism and then tried to turn the church over to Arianism, um, but they one, ran into enormous resistance from the church, and usually as soon as that emperor died, the church flipped back to Trinitarianism immediately. Um, but one of the key things to come out of this is, that, is the very idea that Constantine had thought it was his job as emperor to convene all the leaders of the church and tell them to s figure this issue out and to sort of manage the church this way. And Constantine clearly thought of himself as the head of the Roman Empire. He thought of himself as the head of the church also. And this idea is called Caesaropapism, that Caesar is the, is the father of the church. Um, and we'll see that Caesaropapism sort of, I mean, it can't succeed in the Western Roman Empire um, after the fall of Rome. But we'll see that it does succeed in the Eastern Church. So in the Byzantine Empire, there's a really strong sense that the emperor is the head of the church because the church is seen as a branch of the government. And so the emperor is the head of the government. He's obviously going to be the head of the church. Right? Um, so that's the idea of Caesar of Papism. Now, <clears throat> what happens then when the Western Roman Empire falls in 476? What happens to the church? Well, there were actually about, there were six members of the church. There were six major cities recognized. And, and the heads of the church in those six cities were called metropolitans. And they were seen as the most powerful six members of the church. Uh, and they were in Rome, and they were in Constantinople, and Antioch, and Jerusalem, uh, and Athens, and Alexandria. And the, the one in Rome was seen as sort of the paramount one, because Rome was such the, the center of the Roman Empire. But when the Roman Empire falls in 476, suddenly the, the Bishop of Rome, the Metropolitan of Rome, is outside of the empire. And the other five are still inside the empire. Right? In, they're inside the Byzantine Empire. So, essentially, the five who are in the Byzantine Empire still recognize Caesar of Papas, and they still recognize the Byzantine Emperor, Zeno and then Justinian, as the head of the church. But the Roman bishop, after this, after the fall of the Roman Empire in 476, he begins to claim complete autonomy. He begins to say... Well, I mean, first of all, he's not part of any empire, right? And he begins to say, no, I am, uh, I am independent. Now, there are times, uh, you know, when Theodoric is taking over Italy, um, that, that clearly the, the Bishop of Rome has to bow to that. But gradually, over the centuries, the Bishop of Rome begins to assert not only is he totally independent of any political power, but also that he is still the head of the church, that he is, that the five cities, the five metropolitans, um, the heads of the church in those five cities, should be subordinate to him in Rome. But this causes an enormous problem because for those metropolitans in Constantinople or Athens or whatever, they're under the Byzantine Empire. They're clearly sub subject to the authority of the Byzantine uh, emperor. And he is claiming under Caesar of Papism that he is the head of their church. And Rome is claiming, no, 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 we're the head of the church. Well, what essentially happens is that the five metropolitans in the Eastern Roman Empire cling to the emperor and they or submit to the emperor, and they gradually just stop listening to the pope in Rome. They say, yeah, yeah, you're the head of our church, but if you say something that the emperor doesn't agree with, we're not listening to you. Right? And so the, the, the pope and, the, and the, the bishop of Rome began to call himself the pope, which means the father of the church, the head of the church. The pope is actually etymologically similar, uh, comes from the same root as papa. Um, and so the, the Bishop of Rome is asserting his authority over the church, and the, uh, the other uh, metropolitans are simply ignoring him, and, there's, and this split gradually grows between the two, and ultimately this split would, would break the church apart. That in, in uh, 1054, 
the Pope in Rome would actually excommunicate the, Arch, the, the Metropolitan of Constantinople, and the Metropolitan of Constantinople would actually ex excommunicate the Bishop of Rome. So they would essentially both say the other was a heretic, and they would split their churches apart. And from that point onward, then you have, a, you have the Catholic Church in, based in Rome, which controls uh, the religion of Western Europe, and then you have the, what's called the Orthodox Church, or the Eastern Orthodox Church, which is controlled by the Byzantine Empire. And, and this becomes a fundamental split, and, and they're still split today um, between these two sects of Christianity. But this is, a, this is an important thing, because now Christianity is clearly split. There are different organizations, there are different churches, and as a religion then, Christianity is never going to be unified again. Now, the one other thing that the Eastern Orthodox Church gave us, though, that I really want to point out is, is monasticism, that in the 300s and the 400s and 500s, in, in Egypt and then in Syria, you begin to see groups of people, first individuals, want to, want to really get in touch with God, and so they begin to practice various ways. And St. Anthony is the, is the big um, uh, example here. Um, he, uh, he would go into the desert in, in Egypt and, and for years and just meditate and, and he would, you know, supposedly ate locusts and honey. Um, but he attracted followers and they're like, oh, we all want to, we all want to learn from you. He's like, hey, you know, wait, my, my thing is I'm alone in the desert. You can't come learn from me because then I wouldn't be alone in the desert. Um, but Anthony actually did attract followers and he's, and, and so it's began to evolve these communities of, of, Individuals who would go and they would each live in a in a cave or a different part of the desert, and they would they would be alone for most of the year, and then they would get together once in a while to sort of um, exchange ideas, exchange things, talk about issues they're having, etc. Um, and these began to gradually emerge then into communities, and and you began to see other people forming different kinds of communities, like Saint Pacomius. Um, these communities of people who want to get together and live under a common set of rules focused on worshiping God. And so you begin to see the development of this idea of monasticism, that, that for people to, to really practice their faith profoundly, you have to step away from the world and focus on praying to God, etc. Now this monasticism is already there in Buddhism, right? And, and, and in Jainism. And, and so you see monasticism, it probably the idea was probably influenced by the Silk Roads, etc. We don't know for sure, but certainly in Christianity, it's this. It's it's in Egypt and Syria that you start to see the roots of monasticism, and the first the first monastic communities grow up, and then it spreads throughout the rest of the Roman Empire. And after the split, you see monastic monastic communities appear in the Western Roman Empire also, or rather, in, in what's left of the rest Western Roman Empire. So, <clears throat> the Byzantine Empire then is 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 wound, caught up quite a bit in the evolution of Christianity um, over the centuries, um, the, the later centuries of the Roman Empire, and then after the West has collapsed, um, it's caught up in this controversy and this split in the Christian church. Um, in the third part of the lecture, then, we're going to talk about some of the issues the Byzantine Empire had um, later on in its reign.